have seen and thought as, uh, as they went through their uh, generations before us and I just thought it was worth acknowledging how special this place really is. Uh, I have the great privilege today of representing uh, many different organisations, some of whom are in this room. Um, while I am the CEO of the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network, this is a very large collaborative project and uh, as I said, I've been given the honour of actually presenting and speaking on behalf of uh, the whole of the Western New South Wales region. So I would just like to acknowledge that and those that are in the room that have participated in this, this really great and exciting project. Um, and I certainly hope I can do it justice. Where I think this is important for today's conference and the thinking that's going into our meeting is about four, four critical things that I would ask you to pay attention to. The first thing is around workforce and clearly this is the workforce session so we'll be thinking workforce the whole way through it. We're talking about the whole of the primary workforce here and the services that they deliver. Um, the second is collaboration and I've already heard collaboration many hundreds of times in the last 24 hours and I think that is a key theme that's coming through uh, already from the conference already. Thirdly, partnership and what good partnership looks like. And then fourthly, taking knowledge into action. And I think that's probably the key part of today's presentation is to show that a group of organisations and people can actually take knowledge and move it towards action. And we're hoping to show those first steps that we've taken about working together for a whole of region. Before I go into the slides though, I just wouldn't mind you just spending a couple of seconds just thinking about where you're from and your region and the type of people that you deal with in your day-to-day -day work. And uh, really the key question is, how many organisations do you think you'd be working with if you had the chance to talk about a workforce solution for your region? Is it five? Is it two? Is it ten? Uh, and I think that's important as you start to get a, uh, a perspective on scope and scale of what good collaboration and coordination looks like. The reason that I ask you that question is because of this because uh, I stand here before you with uh, 52 organisations and committees working together across the whole of Western New South Wales and I'm going, many of those are in the room as I've said today, but this is an incredibly huge undertaking and I think there's some wonderful leadership that's been shown not just by organisations and the leaders of organisations but also those that are doing the working community within those organisations to commit to a common principle and common goals to support community. And I think that uh, we may not be able to read all of those names there at the back of the room. It's a really symbolic thing, isn't it, to show that slide, just how many people you could imagine must be involved in this and uh, coming together to help community. So what I've tried to do here in representing the project, uh, which we've called um, at great length the New South Wales uh, 2030 uh, Primary Health Workforce Planning Project, a bit of a mouthful, but each of those words matter. And one of the things that's really critical is the, is the bit about 2030. When the concept of this idea came together, we really wanted to try to break the mould or the, the things that we get used to in dealing with the reactive pressures of workforce. Most of the organisations that are on that list are dealing with crisis situations within Western New South Wales and it's very, very hard not to just spend the whole time thinking about reacting. And there was a conversation about how do we start to plan about the future and think forward. And that's where we come up with 2030, obviously, and thinking, trying to think about 10 years ahead of ourselves. So the next few slides talk about the context of the region of Western New South Wales that some of you uh, know and some of you may not, so I'll sort of talk to that a little bit. Then through the method and some of the key steps that we've taken as a group in working towards this project and now that we're in the, in the into action stage, what that looks like. And also to give you a bit of a summary of the findings that we've made and also where our priorities and investments are going to go uh, moving in the next couple of years. To finish off, I thought I'd just share with you some uh, reflections, my own personal reflections, not the groups, but my personal reflections of trying to work together with so many different organisations. Um, so for those of you that uh, don't know Western New South Wales, well, we're basically talking everything west of Katoomba uh, out towards Broken Hill and the South Australian and Queensland borders. It's a very large region. If I could just acknowledge in the room Andrew Harvey, the CEO of the uh, Western New South Wales Primary Health Network and also Scott McLaughlin the CEO of the Western New South Wales Local Health District. They've been critical drivers of working, of, of organisations working together and it's fantastic that you're both here today. And also um, Steve Rodwell, who's the CEO of the Far Western Local Health District, which is the part in the blue there. And also um, Phil Naden, who's the CEO of uh, Bill and Woodgie Aboriginal uh, Health Services Corporation as well. So all of us have been heavily involved in this uh, and a lot of behind the scenes talking about how to make this thing come together. While there are 50 organisations and committees involved, it's certainly been that small group that have been able to be at the front and try to bring this thing together. What is real is in Western New South Wales we face a crisis. We try very hard not to use that word when we're talking publicly, but I think in a room like this we can. We have a critical workforce shortage across all disciplines within Western New South Wales. 
um, and we need to do some work. And there's a big call out to try to work out how to solve some of these issues. If these issues weren't created yesterday or last year or two or three years ago, it's a generation long issue and uh, we need to really start to think through and call out what help we need. We have dealing with some of the most disadvantaged communities within New South Wales and uh, we think it's time for us to act and I think that's, these are some of the examples of what we're trying to do together. Uh, that's just a slide that RDN has uh, recently compiled through our workforce needs assessment for rural New South Wales. Uh, there's two pictures there which sort of show you where we feel that there's some real pressures now just on our GP workforce. This is just a GP workforce map um, and sort of shows a couple of critical areas. The left, the left hand side is uh, the GP workforce hotspots for uh, just whole of population, but the right side is actually in relation to the Indigenous population. And one of the things that we're finding, and you'll hear through this presentation, is the unique needs of each community and each region is critical when we're designing a workforce solution. So the project came together, and, what, and I won't go through this slide by slide in all the words, but I think I'll just pull out a couple of things here just to really talk to you a little bit about. What we've realised and seen through this work is that every region within New South Wales is different and that would be the same uh, for all of across the country. You've seen one country town, you've seen one country town and those sorts of sayings. But what we have seen across this is while we can talk about a whole of a region approach, and this is a massive, a massive distance that you're talking about here, a vast region, there are sub-regions as well. And the ability to sit and hold and understand and most importantly listen to what each sub-region needs and then each community needs is a really critical part of it. There was about 12 months worth of work in this project before we went public. Uh, of listening and talking and trying to bring people together and get them to commit to uh, or at least have an interest in participating together. And I think that's that really critical part of listening. We can go and tell people what we know, but if we don't have them, if we don't have open our ears and listen to what's coming back, the, that's where the richness really is. The other part to this, he, he was guiding principles. So you see the word principles up there. What we realised is across these multiple of organisations, over 50 of different organisations, each of them have a board, each of them have a purpose and each of them have the need to stay afloat. And what we realised and I start seeing more and more of some of the competitive behaviours that go around individual organisations and people uh, looking to survive uh, creates this competitive uh, tension. And so when we went around for those early first 12 months, it was actually trying to understand what's the common thread? What's the thing that holds us together? And uh, a few of us did a review of most of these organisations' annual reports or their constitutions and started to try to really think through very deeply about and authentically about what, what is the common thread for us in Western New South Wales. And the word that is always there in all of those statutory documents is community. And it was that, it was that word and that thinking about what does a community need and why are we here and it's always about community that actually holds us all together. And we found that to be a really critical element of the idea of trying to talk to people about coming and working together, which often hadn't happened before. Another thing there was about the idea of trying to understand, is it possible in a whole of a region to collectively use the resources of the whole to make something grand happen? So the concept of the sum is greater than the individual and how can we do that? Now I don't know yet if we've actually nailed that, but clearly it's being talked about and at least people are sort of appreciating that conversation and that's been a critical part of this work as well. This is a pretty basic slide, none of this will probably surprise you, but uh, having a methodology behind a big project like this was important and has led to us being able to think about how we, how we profile it in forums like this or through publishing as well. And we did think about, that uh, there was nine key steps that we went about. Um, if I may acknowledge Robin Ramson, who's in the room, will be very embarrassed that I've mentioned her name, but she deserves it. Um, uh, Robin was a sort of lead investigator for this, but part of her work was on top of multiple other things that she did. She also interviewed the CEOs or the clinical leads of these organisations and then uh, coded verbatim 1,000 pages of transcript to try to understand what the unique parts of the needs of Western New South Wales were in comparison to other research that had been done, such as Deb and John's work as well. So we tried to get a feeling for not just the local response, but also was there any differences between short-term short reactive responses to workforce and that concept of long-term. So Robin, I'll, I'll just again sing your praises because so much of this has come from your dedication to your work as well. But these nine steps are important because shortly I'm going to talk to you a bit about what partnership looks like and the mechanisms of good partnership. And we think having the structure around a methodology like this gave people confidence and trust to participate and be involved. 
Where we've landed today is that uh, the project really was working mainly through 2018. Towards the end of 2018, we had the org different organisations in different forms make some sort of commitment, in principle commitment, to see this thing move forward. We were able then to co-fund a project manager role who's now started and she's underway and we're in the process now of implementing the 34 critical actions that we've, uh, that we've thought about and agreed to as a group. So these are some of the critical findings that we've done. Now again, I'm not going to go through each of these point by point, but very happy to share and also if we can help in any way and you'd like to make contact with myself or Robin or Sally or any of the team here, we're very happy to share some of these things. But what I found really interesting listening to the previous um, half an hour of conversation is just the commonality in thinking. In reality, people, people like to know their communities are different, but the reality is most of it's pretty similar. But it's again, it's how we listen and, and foster and encourage uh, people locally to understand their own issues, which I think is a really important part of this. So I'll just call out three or four things here that I found really interesting and um, I thought valuable in terms of this project. So it's the impact of short-term employment contracts on recruitment and also retention. Now again, no, that makes a huge deal of surprise to people. But I know for myself, if I was going to make a move somewhere and I had a 12-month contract or less and no guarantee of that, of, or a, of a future, would I make that move? And that comes up time and time again in our work at RDN and across most of these organisations. And that's a critical issue that we need to deal with within this region. The second is around cultural responsiveness. Um, again, I'm on my own learning journey when it comes to uh, cultural understanding and awareness and safety. But at the same time, what we find is that we must ensure that those that are on rural immersion trips as future workforce or even those that are experienced are willing to understand the cultural needs and, and expectations of each community, um, not just the region as a whole. The bit about responding to local need is critical. So again, this is the whole idea of trying to understand what really does it going to look like within a local community and what is needed to respond to that community's needs is critical. And that's where I think the different uh, needs assessments that are done by organisations is really important as well because that's where you're starting to marry together all the different pieces of thinking, not just a workforce needs assessment but the service needs assessment as well. And then the final thing I thought was really interesting through this work was leadership. And John, I heard you mention a couple of times around the role of uh, service managers. If I may give an example for the Rural Doctors Network in New South Wales as the Rural Workforce Agency in, uh, in that jurisdiction, we think about 80% of our efforts to react to a workforce issue within a local community actually comes about because of a breakdown of relationship between the clinician and the service manager, be it the practice manager or the health facility manager. And what's the fact that we've been able to identify that and now see that allows us to think through what strategies and mechanisms can we now put in place and invest in to support better workplace relationships, safe workplaces and those types of things. But the sum of all that leads to one thing and that's trust. So what we have absolutely heard through the consultations that we've done is around trusting the system and that again comes back to leadership and there's an underpinning need to trust to make a move or a commitment not just to go but also to stay and I think that's a really critical finding and each of these 50 organisations and committees have a role in that for the future. I love a framework, love a picture, so I don't know if you can see this really well at the back, but um, uh, this, is, this is the framework that we create on the back of all the evidence that we built to talk about what long-term workforce planning and support might look like. Happy to see that some photos being taken, so share it around because we want that to be shared because it really is, we think, special work. And uh, again, we'll probably, it, I'm sure it'll be made available through the conference notes and all of that. Um, but what we found really fascinating with this is it's a simple picture but actually people in community have actually understood it and can get it. And we haven't tried to overplay it with all the, you know, if I may say, academic language. It's actually trying to be really simple for communities to understand and how to apply something within their own context. And that's been fantastic. Uh, John, you'll be pleased to know when you went through your three things, I could see each of those in there. So that was, um, you know, again, it's the commonality of thinking that, uh, that I can see across the different parts of the, uh, the country. So then we went to action. So out of all the evidence that was built in the findings, there were 34 key actions that were found and drilled out, if you like, of the work that we did. Again, I won't go through each of these individually, but I'm very happy to share them if you'd like to follow up. Um, but a few of them, were, a couple of things here were quite important. The first of all is the concept of coordination and working together at a regional level was absolutely part of what everybody felt was needed. This idea of trying to overcome the competition part and trying to work together and being given a space to actually sit and talk and share was very important. 
We held, amongst other things, we held a full day workshop in Dubbo uh, in the middle of last year where each of these organisations were participated in and even the way I think that that was set up and encouraged and enabled good conversations and thought sharing was really important. The other thing that's come through is one of the critical themes in these actions is around responding locally or a town-based workforce solution and being able to apply these sort of very high level thinkings that we, we know but actually in the context of a local community and then we need to try to find the way to make that happen. And it's not just funding, it's actually commitment and investment of time as well that's going to be very important for that. One of the other things that we found, and I can see Hamish at the back that I remember we spoke about, it was actually around positivity, this underpinning positivity. There's so, in Western New South Wales particularly, and it's in we're going through a terrible period at the moment of drought and other sort of really crisis sort of issues for communities. And invariably the thing that makes people sing is the idea of being having that underpinning positivity. And again, in the last 24 hours here, I've heard sort of, again, conversations about almost going to the negative about what are the problems that we're dealing with. And I think one of the things that's happened for me over the last six to nine months in this project is, is that thinking about actually let's turn it around, let's talk to the positive and celebrate what we have rurally uh, and, and accept some of the failings or the weaknesses, but actually turn it around to be positive. And I just think that's fantastic. Another one was around co-funded roles, so we're very interested in this. So we have towns across New South Wales, Western New South Wales, that have 0.2, 0.3 FTEs five or six times over with different organisations for a speech pathologist role, for example. And, you know, it's, it's clear when you look at that 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 has to be dealt with. And we cannot fill these roles. No one's going to go bush for a 0.3 FTE. I mean, it just ain't going to happen. And sometimes it's staying the bleeding obvious and then working through how we're going to deal with it. So we're very hopeful through this work that in the next 12 months, and hopefully when we come back again to this conference in the next 18 months, we'll be able to share some great stories of cooperation and sharing of funds and pooling of resources to best support community. So then to finish, um, these are my personal reflections of where we're currently at. And as I said, we're sort of at the, the cusp here of launching into these 34 actions and, uh, and you know, we're starting to see some results. But these are the, these are the key, key things that I've seen across the course of uh, the last 15 to 18 months in this project and hoping that we can have some influence again moving forward. The first thing's around community first. So in our sort of lives as administrators, it's very easy to get caught up in what we need to do. We hear a lot of talk about patient-centred care. Well, I think in workforce we need to be talking about community-centred solutions and I think that's something that I personally think we need to embed definitely more and more so within each of our organisations and their work. The third thing's about cooperation. Again, we've heard this word collaborate many times already in the last 24 hours, but what does it really look like? And the concept of, of non-competitive non organisational behaviour is critical. It's, I mean, it's such a leadership position to have to take. And I, I mean, I even find it hard daily trying to think through the decisions and comments that we're making now. Are they competitive or are they for the good of everybody? And I think it's really, really tough and all of us have that role to play now to try to be a bit higher and, and, and position ourselves a bit, a bit above what's directly in front of us. The next thing is around what does it take to really govern or manage a partnership very well? And I think that the, I've just put a few things there at the bottom there around good partnership management. I've been working in, uh, well, all of us would have, you know, you, the word partnership gets thrown around everywhere you go. But actually what we've actually realised through this project and to have 50 different organisations and all their staff involved is what is good partnership really going to look like? And it's the mechanism of, of governance around partnership and cooperation that I think can't be overlooked and I think it often is. And we've had the chance now to reflect a little bit of our own work in the last six months as we've started to get our head around this. And the concept of structure, ensuring we understand what each partner brings to the table, also the risks to each partner and also where their pressure points are. They take really big hearted conversations and they need to be done in a very safe and caring manner. But without it, at the front end of a partnership, nothing's going to work. And I do think that that's something that uh, we can all learn from and hopefully that we can become better at because without it, I'm not sure we're going to have much success. But that then leads to the final point of my reflections and that's around leadership. So again, you know, as a, um, we're all learning at different times around what the difference between leadership and management is. We can go and read every book that we want and it's sort of a 101 um, conversation, isn't it? But I can see through this project the organisations and the people who are great leaders, who are social leaders, not just managers, and I think that's the sort of skills that we need to be developing. And everybody, no matter what role you're in in community, whether you're a CEO or whether you're a school teacher or you're a clinician in the community or you're a health service manager, each of us have the choice to be leaders or to, be, or to demonstrate leadership behaviour. And without making that choice, we're not quite sure great things will come from a workforce perspective. 
So again, I think part of this will be around what does leadership look like or social leadership in our space? How do we encourage that? How do we celebrate it? And I think that'll be something that we look to try to talk more about in the coming year or two through this project. So that's the, that's the Western New South Wales 2030 Workforce Project. Thanks so much for listening to that and obviously very happy to take any questions as well. Thanks. Look, thank you, Richard. That's a, a great exposition and, and congratulations on doing that body of work. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit daunted by a, a plan involving 50 organisations mm. um, and I'm just, I, I think a regional approach is right. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's right for, yeah. for, for, the, for the country and, and a regional approach is, is, is the appropriate one. Um, and I was just, uh, I want to be a bit pr provocative. So, you know, you're talking about all those fractional appointments yeah. across yes. different organisations. For this region, albeit a big one, is 50, 50 organisations too yep. many? Yep. Thanks, John. So when we first thought about this and wrote the stakeholder list, which got to 36 and then to 45 and then to 50, uh, we nearly pulled the pin uh, because it's too big. It's what, I mean, it's incredibly complicated and we we're actually told by a few people, don't do it, you're actually putting yourself at risk. So putting RDN at risk, if not myself, <laughs> uh, because it's set to fail. But after, you know, and again, in a cooperative sort of spirit and sharing that with people and particularly Scott and Andrew in the room here, knowing that they are in our back the whole way and we're able to slowly and methodically work through this and not without a, not with the time pressure, allowed us to actually go and sit and actually talk. And I think that was really important. So again goes back to that idea of creating a safe space to do good work it was really important and not being time pressured. Proof will be in the pudding, no doubt, but hopefully uh, not, the, you know, what, what is failure going to look like uh, or what is success going to look like? And I think they're the things that we're dealing with now. Um, in terms of the co-funded roles, what we've found is that it, there are pockets across that region where there are three or four organisations who, are in, who have the, the point FTEs, but they're not the same organisations in each patch. So we're, we're doing sort of one by one conversations now, asking each organisation, are they interested in participating? Some have said no and that's totally fine, so we're not going to hang anyone out to dry. It's just exactly, there's reasons for that, but where we are getting multiple yeses, that's where we think we'll put our energy to start. Thanks. We have a question here, David. Uh, thanks, Richard. David Lindsay from JCU. Thank uh, you. Um, can you comment on um, the newly elected uh, government you've got in New South Wales and, uh, and their uh, uh, approach... <laughs> their approach to... Um, being involved in this process, what do you see? Yeah, thanks. In terms we love, of going love, a, love a political question. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, what I've got to say is uh, the last three months since Christmas in New South Wales has been a circus. So we have been pushed and pulled, torn and you know told all these sorts of things. It's really surprised me just the, uh, how um, chaos. I don't know the word chaos, but how chaotic the environment's been for us in New South Wales. It's really blown me away, to be honest, and have the two elections coming on the back of each other. Um, whatever side we sit on, I think the result gives us some stability at the moment. I think that there's some really strong commitments from um, the, the incumbent government to actually hold some things together, in our space at least, and so we're, I'm quite uh, pleased about that. Uh, and, and what I have found, in particularly in rural regions, there's actually st quite a strong cooperation between all sides. Um, and yes, I'm not, actually, it's, I think it's landed okay for us at the moment, yeah, but uh, it was certainly, it's been a very, very tough three months for all of us, yeah. Yes. If I, if I could just um, make some further comments about that first question from John to Richard around the partnership. If I could just add that, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of organisations with skin in the game, you continue to perpetuate the competition rather than the collaboration and I think what's been critical to this project is the number of times we've gone back to those um, stakeholders and kept them informed, kept them engaged. Things like the forum that brought those 50 um, organisations together to talk about the findings and to have further conversations about um, how this related to their work and um, get that commitment of 34 priority actions and then to be able to put that into waves that people committed to um, and so that they could see. And when we interviewed them, uh, one of the problems they said was, we've heard all this before, but what's different? And so part of it was the 10-year commitment 
Um, but the other thing was that we were getting them to sign up and actually agree to some actions. Not all 50 organisations will be involved in all of those prey actions. They'll all have their time in the sun. You know, some will be involved at different times throughout the process. The other key thing is the four key organisations committed some funding uh, to start with around a project manager. And that project manager has enabled, facilitated the collaboration, built the trust, made it um, clear that it's not the ownership of one organisation that we're all part of this. And I think that's been, you know, one of the insights about a critical aspect of partnership that's kept um, people engaged and can see the future. Question from up the back, yes. Do you want to stand up and yell a lot? So I think the question there was the um, ability of a project like this to raise to a, the attention of policy makers um, MBS reform, uh, particularly when a GP leaves town and if the money goes with a GP based on the <coughs> service models of care. Is that, is that a fair reflection of that question? Well, basically, maybe we've done what we ought to be and not the right yeah. way. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. So uh, if I may answer that in two parts. So uh, interestingly, for the Rural, rural Doctors Network, got to be a bit careful where we say this sometimes, but for us in a workforce solution, it may not always be a GP-led solution as well. So for us as a workforce agency, we're looking community by community and trying to determine what the best outcome is for that community. And it may not always have a GP involved or at the centre because of the different needs of different communities. So that's a really important point to that. That then leads to what does the funding models look like? And without a doubt, that's one of the critical issues that we're dealing with at the moment. What we hope in the sense of Western New South Wales is to have this cooperative approach. We now have a platform to be able to go and speak and represent the needs of the region and certain communities around different funding streams from government. We haven't taken that step yet, but it's certainly one of the actions that's listed. formula 